Hey everybody, Miss Hill here, and uh, I am recording you a lecture on Individual Module 5.2, where we are talking about the concept of reproduction, specifically intrapartum care. And this is PowerPoint 1 for Individual Module 5.2. Your learning objectives are included here, and uh, again, they're the same as in your syllabus and in your book. <clears throat> this lecture is also being recorded uh, for the fall class of 2019. So we can't talk about labor and delivery or intrapartum care without tipping our hat to this model of family-centered care type nursing. And family-centered care uh, is a model of care that is based on the philosophy that physical, socio-cultural, spiritual, and economic needs of the family are combined together. And that we have to consider those things collectively when we plan care <clears throat> for people who are having children. Um, Family-centered care promotes an environment that is much more like the home environment. It's more comfortable. Um, it enhances family interaction and enhances a comfortable family environment. And examples of this would be exactly what you see in this picture, which is a birthing room. Um, we have different types of birthing rooms. We can have LDRs, which are labor and delivery rooms, and we can have LDRPs, which are labor, delivery, recovery, and postpartum rooms. Um, <clears throat> there are some places that have a room that you labor, deliver, um, recover in, and, and that's where you stay for the remainder of your uh, hospital stay. And the importance of this is that it promotes a successful labor and delivery. When people feel comfortable in their environment, they are more likely to have a better outcome. They feel like they can have a little control over <clears throat> their um, over their day, over their care, and uh, it just promotes a better outcome. So it's important that the rooms in labor and delivery promote this family kind of environment because that's who we're taking care of. So just an overview of intrapartum care in general. Um, in the final weeks of pregnancy, the mother and the baby start to prepare to, uh, for the birth process. Um, the fetus continues to develop to a point that it is ready to live outside of mom. And the, the mom also undergoes some different types of physical and psychological changes as well. And we'll talk about those. The mother also needs to be aware of the different signs that can um, indicate that she might be going into labor. So she needs to know when to report to the hospital or to let her health care provider know. Um, if she sees any of these signs, because it could mean that labor is, is close. So if her um, membranes rupture or <clears throat> her water breaks, that's definitely something she should report. If she starts feeling uterine contractions that are much more regular, that are more frequent, that are stronger, closer together, um, those are things that she would want to let someone know about. Um, and she probably would want to time those for herself, so it would be important to teach her how to do that. <clears throat> if she notices any vaginal bleeding, um, the closer to labor that you get, the cervix starts to thin out, starts to open up, and uh, women may pass their mucus plug. Um, a lot of the times it's streaked with the blood, their vaginal discharge increases, um, and it's much more... Um, much more prevalent and, and blood streaked. And then also decreased fetal movement. So the, the longer in pregnancy we go, the more the baby grows, the bigger the baby gets, and the less room it has to move in the abdomen. So typically fetal movement can be 
<clears throat> a little decreased the later that you get in pregnancy. However, if she starts to really notice a big difference in um, fetal movement and it's way decreased, then that could possibly be a danger sign. <clears throat> um, Family-centered care is a very holistic approach to nursing. <clears throat> and again, birthing rooms are a good example of that. When we talk about uh, intrapartum care, there are five critical factors that we have to um, consider. And those are what we call the five P's. The passage, which is the fetus, the passenger, which uh, the passage, which is the pelvis, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> the passenger, which is the fetus, the relationship between those two, power, which is contractions and pushing, and then psychosocial considerations. So how well is mom prepared? And abnormalities that affect any factor, any one of these five P's, can alter the outcome of labor and potentially jeopardize the mom or the baby. Understanding these five uh, critical factors are important for labor nurses to be able to recognize so um, that they can prevent any potential bad outcomes. So let's talk about the passage. The passage includes these following things, the maternal pelvis, the cervix, and the vaginal canal, and the introitus, which <clears throat> is the external opening of the vagina. Um, specifically for the maternal pelvis, we have to consider the size of it. So is it adequate for the passenger to fit through? And there are a bunch of different types of classifications of pelvises, and we're going to um, look at those uh, in the next slide. And moving on to the cervix, is it going to dilate and efface? And defacement means thin out, and dilate means open up. So is it going to do those two things to a point that is adequate so that we will have um, dilation of 10 centimeters, which is fully dilated, and an effacement of 100%, which is completely effaced. Um, so if we, if we have those two things, then our passage can be adequate for the fetus to pass through. And then the vaginal canal and the introitus. As labor starts, a whole lot of hormonal changes occur in mom's body. And some of those hormonal changes will actually allow the tissues in the vaginal canal to um, begin to expand. Um, se vaginal secretions become a little, uh, become more. Um, so the ability for this to happen um, also affects whether or not the baby can get through. The vaginal canal is all swollen up. Um, and the introitus will not expand and distend like it's supposed to for labor and delivery, then we can end up with complications. So when we talk about size of the pelvis and type of pelvis, um, we have to consider um, pelvimetry or measurements that the physician takes and we got to take into account the three different sections of the pelvis. There's an inlet and a mid pelvis and an outlet. So at three different spots in this one bony structure, a fetal, uh, a fetal body, head or body, could become lodged in place and not be able to pass through adequately. So we got to make sure that all three of those sections are adequate and measurements are good for the baby to come through. Typically, um, that is the case, um, especially with the gynecoid pelvis. So with the gynecoid pelvis, that is the most common and the most favorable type of pelvis that we find in, uh, in women. And it has a nice rounded inlet 
there's an adequate mid pelvis and an adequate outlet. So it makes it the most favorable for birth. The android pelvis, on the other hand, is a very heart-shaped looking pelvis. There's a very small mid-pelvic section in the android type of pelvis and a small outlet. It's not favorable for uh, labor and delivery. The babies who, uh, babies who are born to moms who have android uh, an android pelvis have a very slow descent into the pelvis. The fetal head can enter um, the inlet because the inlet is typically okay, but as it enters the pelvis, it enters the pelvis in a transverse position, so the head go, enters sideways. And a lot of the times when it hits that small mid pelvis, um, a rest of labor is common, meaning labor kind of stops. <clears throat> For the platyploid pelvis, that is um, an oval shaped pelvis that goes from left to right. The mid pelvis is reduced and this one has an inadequate outlet. So again, we're looking at a mid pelvis and an outlet that are um, not favorable. The fetus will engage or the head will come through or whatever part will come through in a transverse position. So from side to side or left to right. And they have a really difficult descent through the mid pelvis because it's so reduced. And then once the fetal head reaches the outlet, there is a delay of progress there because the outlet is inadequate. For the anthropoid one, this is an also an oval shaped pelvis, but it's oval shaped from front to back or anterior to posterior. This one does have an adequate mid pelvis and it also has an adequate outlet and um, labor and delivery can progress just fine with the anthropoid pelvis. So it can, uh, we can have favorable outcomes from both the gynecoid or the anthropoid, um, but we much prefer to see the gynecoid. That is the most favorable for a vaginal birth. So now let's talk about the passenger or the fetus. The uh, fetal head is the largest part of the baby. And the fetal head contains three parts, the face, the skull, and the cranial vault. Um, the fetal head also contains sutures. We have a frontal suture a sagittal suture, and a coronal and lamboidal sutures. So if you can see my mouse, uh, the frontal suture is here, sort of down, uh, down the forehead. Um, the sagittal suture is between the anterior and the posterior fontanelles, and the lamboidal sutures come off of either side of the posterior fontanelle there. Coronal sutures come off of the side of the anterior fontanelle on either side. So all of these sutures create bony plates for the fetal head. And this is important because it allows the head to mold during labor and delivery. So as the fetal head comes through the passageway, the bony plates can sort of scoot one on top of the other and mold the baby's head to fit best into the pelvis. So that is very, that's very important because with the fetal head being the largest part of the baby, um, and it's also the least compressible part. If we can make some minor little changes as it comes through the pelvis and those plates start to slide one on top of the other here or there so that it can fit better, we, might, we can have a better outcome. Um, fontanelles on the fetal head are also important assessment points for you, for you as nurses. 
and the anterior fontanelle is uh, the lar it's the largest fontanelle and it is in the shape of a diamond and typically this fontanelle in in children close up around 18 months um, 12 to 18 months and the posterior fontanelle is in the shape of a triangle and this fontanelle closes up around six to eight weeks in babies you'll often hear old people refer to these as the soft spots in the baby's head um, and they're important because fontanelles can help us as nurses identify the position of a fetus during a vaginal exam and it's helpful in assessing neurological and hydration status after the baby is born um, <clears throat> there are different landmarks that we can talk about also on the fetal head and when I, uh, landmarks um, are areas that you can feel for during a vaginal exam to tell you um, positioning of the baby. Um, the mentum is the fetal chin. The syncopate is the brow or like the eyebrow bone. The bregma is the anterior fontanelle. And vertex is the area between the anterior and the posterior fontanelles. So kind of right there between the sagittal, uh, right there along the sagittal suture is what we refer to as a vertex. <clears throat> and occiput is the area beneath the posterior fontanelle. So those are your landmarks on the skull. Another thing we consider with a passenger is fetal attitude. And fetal attitude is determined by the related parts to one another. When you did your assessments, um, when you did your newborn assessments, we talked about tone and the tone of the baby, how flexed the baby was. So when we um, refer to fetal attitude, we're talking about that type of relationship is the baby mostly flexed up or is the baby extended so flexion versus extension moderate flexion of the head arms and legs is what we consider normal so that means moderate flexion of the head meaning chin to the chest flexion of the arms onto the chest so elbows bent and sort of pulled up towards the face and then flexion of the legs onto the abdomen so the knees sort of pulled up that's what we call a fetal position um, <clears throat> when you hear somebody say that person is in a fetal position that's what it means we're talking about moderate flexion of all those body parts so in uh, example A this is moderate flexion of the head, the arms, and the legs. This is what we consider normal. Normal attitude. Fetal lie, <clears throat> on the other hand, has to do um, with uh, the position of the fetus's cephalocaudal axis in relationship to the mother's cephalocaudal axis. So those are your big, huge nursey words, but really what that means is the baby's spine in relationship to the mom's spine. <clears throat> so is the baby uh, longitudinal or is the baby transverse? Or another way to think about it is, is the baby parallel to the mom's spine or is the baby perpendicular to the mom's spine? That's what we consider fetal lie. Fetal presentation is determined by fetal lie and the presenting part. So we can describe fetal presentation as either cephalic, which means head down, breech, which means butt down, or we can have shoulder presentations, which would mean that your baby is transverse. Um, and the other two, your baby is longitudinal. The fetal head presents in about 97% of births and in a, the other 3% of births, the baby presents in a breech manner. 
Um, these are all breech and shoulder presentations are considered mal presentations and that means that labor is not going to proceed as expected. We want these babies to present in a cephalic manner. And so here are uh, some different cephalic presentations that you should be aware of. A is a vertex presentation and remember we um, said vertex is a landmark on the fetal head. Um, vertex is the, the point between the anterior and the posterior fontanelles on the fetal head. This is what we want. We want babies to present in a vertex position and you can also see in this picture in the vertex, uh, in the vertex presentation that this baby has good flexion as well. So we have a good attitude. Um, feet are flexed up, arms are flexed up, and chin is flexed down towards the chest. Um, <clears throat> the importance of this is um, that in a vertex position, the smallest diameter of the fetal head is presenting into the maternal pelvis. So that makes labor and delivery easier because the passenger is in a good position to make it through the passageway. Um, it's just like if you can think about it in terms of like trying to squeeze yourself between a couple of poles um, or even think about a table that's um, scooted too close up to um, a wall. If you are trying to walk through between the table and the wall straight on, you have the largest diameter of yourself presenting into that passageway. So to be able to squeeze to your chair or to squeeze behind that table, you turn yourself sideways so that your back is facing the wall and the front of you is facing the table. And you might have to walk side to side to get yourself to the other end. So this is sort of the same concept. You have changed the diameter of your body to squeeze through that location or that passageway. And that's exactly what a baby does whenever it presents in a vertex position. It presents the smallest diameter of that presenting part or the head into the pelvis. So it just allows for an easier passageway. <clears throat> Um, in B, uh, this one, this baby is in a military position, meaning the head is straight on, looking straight on. Um, there is no flexion or extension of the head, and the occipitofrontal diameter is what is presenting, just meaning the very top of the head. So the diameter that's presenting into the pelvis is much greater than that in a vertex position. So let's move on to C. In C, this baby has a partially extended head and the largest anterior posterior diameter is presenting. So again, a larger position or a larger diameter from here to here is presenting into the pelvis instead of something small like from here to here. Um, in C, that's the brow presentation and what is presenting into the pelvis there, the landmark that is presenting is the brow or the, um, the syncope is the nursery word. <clears throat> D is a face and what we have here is a hyperextension of the fetal head. So the submentobregmatic diameter is presenting. Remember the bregma is the chin and submento just basically means um, behind the forehead because the mentum is the forehead, right? When we're talking about landmarks. So what you have presenting is the submentobregmatic diameter, which is a really large diameter compared to your vertex presentation. So that makes passing through the passageway much more difficult. <clears throat> and 
And I would be remiss if I didn't mention breach presentations because we do see those. Um, in a breach presentation, what you have is the sacrum is what is presenting into the pelvis. That's the, um, the landmark that you feel for. So the butt's presenting and the sacrum is your, is your landmark. Um, and we classify breech positions in relation to the position of the hips and the knees. So we can have a complete breech, which means the buttocks and the feet are what are presenting. We can have an incomplete breech or footling is the other term for that. And what you have here is um, the, the feet presenting and it can be also a double or a single. So you can see um, both feet down or you can see one, just one foot down. And in Frank, the buttocks are presenting. So the hips are flexed up, it, but the knees are not. Their feet are towards the face in a Frank presentation. All of these are mal presentations, which mean bad, right? Um, and why, why would these be bad? And the reason is because the, the fetal head is the largest portion of the passenger. So if the smallest portion of the passenger is what presents and gets through the pelvis first, the largest part could potentially become stuck. So we always want the largest portion of the fetus to come out first, and that happens to always be the head, unless there's some kind of congenital anomaly. And lastly, we have shoulder presentations. This is also a malpresentation, and your landmark for a shoulder presentation is the acromion um, which is that bony part of your shoulder. So that's what you would feel if you did a vaginal exam is the acromion. This is also called a transverse lie as well because this baby is in a transverse position. So <clears throat> moving on to passage and passenger relationship we have to consider three different things. We focus on three different areas. We focus on engagement, station, and fetal position. For engagement, what happens is uh, the largest diameter of the presenting part reaches or passes through the pelvic inlet. So you can see in this photograph there is a line on the fetal head, and that is the largest diameter that has to make it through the pelvis. And then you see uh, a little dotted line here at the pelvic inlet. Once that largest diameter reaches that point or passes through that point, we have engagement of the presenting part. It can occur um, weeks before labor, or it can happen during labor. It is, um, it can be determined by vaginal exams or Leopold maneuvers. So there are assessment techniques you can utilize to decide whether or not this baby is engaged. And then um, we also describe this positioning in terms of syncliticism or asyncliticism. And that just means where is the sagittal suture? So the sagittal suture, again, is the suture that runs between the anterior and the posterior fontanelle, right down the middle of the head. So where is that sagittal suture in relationship to the maternal symphysis, pubis, and sacrum? <clears throat> so is the sagittal suture turned more towards the anterior portion of the mom, which would mean more towards the symphysis pubis? Is it directly in the middle, which would be syncliticism? Or is it turned more towards the sacrum or the posterior portion of the maternal pelvis? And that means asyncliticism. The reason this is important is because if a baby engages in an asynclitic manner, 
it can affect um, descent into the pelvis or whether they're they're able to pass through the pelvis at all because they've sort of engaged themselves in a cattywampus position. Synclitism, however, means they engaged very uh, nice and easy um, in a direct manner where they're supposed to be. So um, I'm trying to think of an example. Think of it similar to, um, hmm. Think of it as maybe like a uh, one of those baby toys where you have to insert the shapes into um, into the holes. So there might be this um, like contraption that's a um, like a square or a box, and it has a bunch of cutouts in it, like a cutout for a or cutout for a triangle or a circle, and then it comes with all these different shapes inside of it, and you can take those shapes out of the little box, and then um, it's a children's toy, and then the child learns the shapes by putting the shapes through the holes back into the box. So you can think of synclitism and asynclitism in kind of that same way. If the baby or the child can line up the shape directly with the hole, then it goes through nice and easy and it'll just drop into the box. But if um, the baby or the child who's playing this game doesn't, maybe tries to put it in a little sideways and doesn't get the shape directly over um, the passageway right directly in the middle then the shape is not going to move through that passageway and drop into the box because it's been engaged in, um, in, in an asynclitic manner meaning not directly into the middle. I hope that I hope that example sort of helps you make sense of what syncliticism and asyncliticism is. Um, in a prima gravita uh, engagement happens approximately two weeks before term gestation, but in multiparas, uh, they may experience engagement several weeks before or during the onset of labor. It really just depends on the mom. All right, so another thing that we have to think about is station. And station is determined by the relationship of the presenting part to the ischial spines of the pelvis. Um, the ischial spines in the pelvis are two little bony-like prominences that come out to either side of the maternal pelvis. And the ischial spines are what we consider zero station. Um, once the, the presenting part reaches those ischial spines, that mom or that fetus is at zero station. We determine this by doing a sterile vaginal exam um, because you can feel the ischial spines on a mom's pelvis whenever you do a vaginal exam. And if you can notice that the baby's head is, di is directly between those ischial spines, um, or, or right at the ischial spines, then we call that mom, uh, we call it zero station. Anything above the ischial spines, we refer to as minus. So um, that fetus could be minus one, minus two, minus three, et cetera. And then anything below that is plus one, plus two, plus three. Um, once the baby passes zero station or passes ischial spines, it's all good from there. The baby is on its way out. So that's a way that can help you remember um, the difference between plus and minus. The ischial spines are typically the narrowest portion of the pelvis. So that's where the fetus has to get through. That's the smallest section that they have to get through to pass um, through the passageway. Um, if there is a failure for the fetus to descend um, and we also have strong contractions, there 
there could be an issue that is caused because there's a disproportion between the maternal pelvis and the presenting part of the fetus. There could be a malpresentation, so a, a, bad, a bad presentation of the baby. The baby could have engaged in an asynclitic manner, or there might be more than one fetus. Okay, fetal position is determined by the relationship between a landmark on the fetal presenting part and the front, back, and sides of the maternal pelvis. So some landmarks that uh, we want to talk about are the occiput, the mentum, the sacrum, and the acromion. So, uh, if, a, if you feel an acromion when you do a sterile vaginal exam, then your baby is presenting in uh, a transverse position or a, a, your baby is transverse lie, and the shoulder is what is presenting. If the landmark that you feel is a sacrum when you do your sterile vaginal exam, then what you have presenting is a breech presentation. You have a butt that's presenting because you're feeling the sacrum on your sterile vaginal exam. On the other hand, if you have a mentum that you can feel, so the mentum again is the, the forehead. If you feel the mentum presenting, um, then your baby is in a, a face position. And then the occiput, on the other hand, means your baby is in a vertex position. And that is what we want to see. Remember, the um, vertex position is good. That will give us a good outcome. And the mentum is the chin, not the forehead. I apologize. So if you, you feel uh, a mentum as your landmark that's presenting into the pelvis on a sterile vaginal exam, then your baby is in a face presentation. The landmarks on the uh, on mom however, come from a pelvic standpoint. So we can consider those landmarks either right, left, anterior, or posterior, or, uh, um, or the baby can engage in, in those areas transversely as well. <clears throat> and remember that when you're looking at these and describing these, we're talking about describing them from the maternal standpoint. So from the maternal right or the maternal left. Um, just like when you document putting an IV into somebody, you document it on uh, their side, their right side, not from the way you are actually viewing it if you stand in front of them. Um, assessment techniques to determine fetal position include inspection and palpation of the maternal abdomen um, and also vaginal exams. To determine what position that uh, a fetus is in, the nurse notes which quadrant of the maternal pelvis the appropriate landmark is directed towards or falls within. And occiput anterior is the most common one. It's the one we like to see. So here is an example of um, some vertex positions for a fetus. So again, vertex means that the baby is presenting into the pelvis in a nice flexed manner. The chin is to the chest and the smallest diameter of the fetal head is presenting into the pelvis. So that's good. This is what we want. We want a vertex position. Um, whenever we are doing a vaginal exam on a vertex position, the landmark that you're going to be feeling when you do a sterile vaginal exam is the occiput. So remember the occiput 
is the area behind the posterior fontanelle on the fetal head. So back here, if you can see my mouse. Now, in this picture, um, what you're looking at are maternal legs, and you're seeing a fetal skull down between uh, the maternal pelvis. These top four positions in this picture are um, mal positions. These are ones that might hinder the progress of labor and delivery. It doesn't mean the baby cannot fit through that way or um, things will, things just might not go um, as expected, but it doesn't mean there cannot be a vaginal delivery. So the L, the R, and the R over here uh, in the first letter of these mnemonics uh, stand for left and right of the maternal pelvis. This last one that says P uh, stand is that one. That is supposed to be an R. So we're talking about left or right in the first letter. That means left or right of the maternal pelvis. The letter that's in the middle or the second letter is talking about the presenting part of the fetus. So in this case, we're in a vertex position, so the presenting part is the occiput. So that's what the O stands for, is occiput. The last letter of this mnemonic stands for either posterior, anterior, or transverse. Again, we're talking about the mom's pelvis. So the first letter and the last letter in this mnemonic is referring to the mother. And the middle letter refers to the presenting part of the fetus. So we're looking at, uh, if you divide this maternal pelvis into quarters, just draw a middle uh, line right down the middle um, horizontally, and another line right down the middle vertically, we can check to see which quadrant is the presenting part in. The presenting part is the occiput, and we can tell that by the posterior fontanelle, which is a triangle. So that's how we know what we're feeling for on a vaginal exam. And if we know that the uh, posterior fontanelle is in the po closer to the posterior portion of the maternal pelvis, it's over to the left side of the maternal pelvis, then we know that that baby is in a vertex position that is left occiput posterior and so forth. So let's do uh, these two in the middle or transverse positions means just directly between anterior and posterior and it's either to the left or to the right, depending on where the posterior fontanelle and the occiput fall. But the one that we really like to see is occiput anterior. So it doesn't matter whether that means left or right. From a maternal standpoint, we just like the baby to be anterior um, because labor will progress and delivery will be much easier this way. So if we divide the pelvis into quarters, uh, a line vertically and then a line horizontally so that we have four sections in, in the maternal pelvis and we just have to determine where is the posterior fontanelle, which quadrant does the posterior fontanelle fall in. Well in this particular picture, if we have drawn it into, um, into quadrants, our posterior fontanelle, which again is our triangle, and the occiput, which is the landmark we're feeling, falls into um, the anterior portion to the left side of the pelvis or towards the left side of the pelvis. So we call that left occiput anterior. Um, it takes a long time to get positioning, you guys. It's something that you really have to think about and study. So don't get frustrated when you've heard it one time and you don't understand it. Read it in your book. Listen again. Draw you some pelvises. And um, the only ones that I really care that you are knowledgeable about are those vertex positions.
All right, so let's talk about power. Power is, uh, when we talk about power, we consider two um, different actual forces of labor and birth. So contractions, which are the primary force. This, these are uterine muscular contractions and they cause change during the first stage of labor. And then we have pushing effort or bearing down. And this is a secondary force where the mom uses her abdominal muscles to push during the second stage of labor or she bears down. Um, in the primary, the primary and the secondary forces of power work together to help uh, deliver the baby. So contractions are rhythmic intermittent tightening of the uterine muscles. Um, the reason that they are intermittent is because we need time for the fetus to be able to reoxygenate and we need time for the maternal uterus and the placenta to be able to reoxygenate. Um, we don't want also the pressure to build up so forcefully inside of the uterus that it ruptures. So there needs to be some resting tone. It would be like your heart staying contracted continuously. Um, your heart beats uh, and contracts intermittently to be able to pump the blood out to your body. If it stayed contracted constantly, there would be no oxygenation because the blood would it uh, there would be too much pressure in the heart and the blood wouldn't move like it should. So it's the same concept in a uterus. That's why contractions are intermittent. It allows for oxygenation of both mom and, and baby. Um, contractions cause effacement and dilation of the cervix when they are effective. There are three phases of a contraction. There's an increment, which is the phase where it increases an acme, which is the peak of a contraction where it's at its strongest, and a decrement, which is where it decreases back to resting. Um, we describe contractions in a few different terms. Frequency is what we refer to when we're talking about how often are the contractions happening. And duration it refers to how long are they lasting? Intensity refers to how strong are they? And uh, we can measure intensity a couple of different ways. We can measure intensity with an internal monitor, um, but mostly we monitor those with an external monitor that fits on the outside of the mom's abdomen. And it's called a TOCO but it's just an estimate. The internal monitor gives us a, a very accurate reading. It tells us exactly what it is pressure-wise. So to assess intensity, a nurse actually has to put her hand on the mother's belly. And we describe intensity in terms of mild, moderate, or strong if we have an external monitor. So mild would feel like your chin if you put your finger and you touch your chin, that's what mild would feel like. Moderate is gonna feel more like your nose, more like the, um, the ligament um, structure at the end of your nose. And strong is gonna feel like your forehead. So very hard. And again, it's really important that contractions stay intermittent and not too close together. The resting tone that your uterus gets in between contractions is a very important part of contractions, if not the most important part, um, because it allows um, a restoration of that uteroplacental circulation. So it's a respite time for the mother and for oxygenation of the baby. So here's an example of contractions and what they look like uh, down here on this lower, um, this lower graph, you're looking at contractions. Um, the increment again is where they start to go up. The acme is right here up at the top. 
and decrement is down as it comes back to resting. What's in between these contractions is considered resting tone. Uh, with an internal monitor, normal resting tone is somewhere between 10 and 12 millimercuries of pressure. Um, and as you move through the stages of labor or move through the first stage of labor, the contraction strength will continue to increase and increase and increase until it is time um, for the mom to start second stage or pushing. Let's also talk about the pushing effort or bearing down. And this is another really important part of the power portion of those five critical P's. Um, this is a contraction of the maternal abdominal muscles. And this is solely um, controlled by the mother. Contractions themselves are an involuntary um, reaction. So the moms, moms cannot control contractions, but she can control pushing effort, which is why um, this is a secondary part of the power equation. Um, pushing doesn't happen until the cervix is completely dilated to 10 centimeters and 100% effaced. And the reason for that is because if the mother starts to push before the cervix is completely dilated and out of the way, um, then the tissues may start to swell and become edematous. And if that's the case, we've affected our passageway and uh, the baby might not be able to be born vaginally if that occurs. Um, pushing is again an active response from the mother in order to deliver the baby. It helps aid in um, expulsion of the fetus and the placenta, and it is solely dependent on the mom's ability to bear down with enough force to do what's necessary. And um, if the mom has some kind of problem with her ability to bear down, so maybe she has an epidural and she can't feel very well, or um, maybe she's had some type of perineal block that has decreased her sensation in that area, the pressure that she is supposed to feel to make her want to bear down. Um, if she has some type of interruption in that process, then her effectiveness of pushing um, may not be as adequate as it should be. So a nurse is um, very important during the second stage of labor or the pushing stage of labor because you have to coach your patients. Um, pushing happens with contractions. We don't want moms to push between contractions whenever they have that resting tone. We want them to rest during that resting, um, that resting time. And again, you know, if they start to push prior to being fully dilated or effaced, we can start to see um, cervical edema. They can tear their cervix. They'll get, um, if they're pushing between contractions, they're going to end up with maternal exhaustion. And just like with everything in uh, maternity, psychosocial considerations are very important. So is the parent ready? Are they ready for the final, um, the final critical point in this time of their life? What are their fears, their anxieties? Many moms have birth fantasies about how things are supposed to go or how things are going to go for her. And oftentimes those birth fantasies are not fulfilled. Um, how excited are they? Do they have positive emotions? Does the mom have plenty of support? Um, this affects both parents too. So, so the mom and her partner. Um, there are also psychosocial factors that can affect this process. Have the couple m moved through those uh, 
pregnancy tasks that they need to move through in order to um, come to a point that they have accomplished what they need to to make it through this maturational crisis time in their in their family. So have they moved through those adaptive processes appropriately? Um, what are their coping mechanisms in response to the stress that this situation has caused for their family? Are they prepared for childbirth? Do they have things prepared at home? Um, have they do, do they have babysitters for other kids that they might have? Do they have a crib set up? Um, so have they moved through the adaptive process from, some, from trimester to trimester so that they're prepared for this point? What are the cultural influences? Are we taking care of a Muslim patient? Are we taking care of a Jewish person um, who recognizes the Sabbath? Um, are we taking care of um, are we taking care of a Jehovah's Witness who might not accept a blood transfusion if there is a postpartum hemorrhage? It's always really important to be cognizant of the cultural influences you're dealing with. Um, some Hispanic people have a very stoic response to pain. Labor is a painful thing. If you can, um, for if you have knowledge of those generalizations in regards to cultural influences, you can help to better take care of your patient. And if you don't know, just ask. That's okay. Um, expectant women um, are they mentally prepared for labor? Um, Part of what gets women ready for that is that nesting behavior that they experience before labor hits. And that's kind of like psyching themselves up to do this thing. Birth is um, a physical and an emotional stressor. So being psychologically prepared for it is really important for patients. And um, it's very important that they feel empowered. Um, that they feel like they have some control over how this situation, this labor and the delivery and the birth of their baby is going to play out. If they feel empowered through this process, which is something that the nurse can help them do is feel empowered, then they're going to view their experience much more positively than um, if they feel completely out of control and like everyone else is running the show. So allowing them the opportunity to feel like they run the show um, is helps them to have a much more positive outcome from a psychosocial standpoint. So, so there it is right there, empowerment. Having control over their body is key to a positive view of their labor and birth. Um, also, it's important to consider whether they've done this before or not. Um, are they a, a prima para or are they a multi para? Because that will affect their outlook on how this process is supposed to go. Um, prima paras need a lot more uh, love and nurturing from the labor nurse and a lot more education um, than your multi parents do because they've been there before. What does their support system look like? Some people prefer not to have anybody with them. Some women don't want their family members to see them in pain. Um, some women, especially if they're prima paras, um, especially if they're young, they may be embarrassed about the birthing process, so they might not want people around. Um, and some people choose to have particular people be in the room with them. Some women want their mothers and their husbands there. Um, some women want their friends. Um, so, so who are their support people? Who do they want included? It's important for you as the nurse to know that information and to help them um, to help provide that support system as closely as possible um, as you can. How they view their birth experience after it's over 
can also affect their mothering behaviors. If someone has had an extremely difficult labor and a very difficult birth, maybe it ended up in a C-section, maybe she was in severe pain because her epidural didn't work, maybe she really felt tortured for how many ever hours she had to be in labor. That is really, that could, I have seen it actually, affect the way they mother um, at the end of that. Sometimes they're very angry about how things turned out because their birth fantasy wasn't met and they felt completely powerless during this process. So they might not want to hold the baby. They might not want to see the baby because there's a little bit of blame um, that's going on. And, and they have, they're going through kind of a grieving process. They have um, they've had a loss of what they thought things would be like. Um, they feel um, they if it's been a terrible experience where they felt tortured, they just may not have the energy or may not even have the want to even look at the baby. And um, so a nurse comes in. Um, your psychosocial nursing skills really have to kick in at that point to help them bond because the bonding could really be affected. Any activities that the mom or the healthcare pro providers can do to enhance the birth experience will in the end benefit the mom and the baby um, and their connection to each other or the bonding that happens and how quickly it happens. So. If you can, um, if you can create an environment where they feel empowered, where they feel like you are providing them the opportunity um, to have some control over their care um, when the baby is born, if you can put that baby skin to skin on mom and provide those opportunities, it really helps the outcome in the end. Um, and then we can't forget about the partner who's there supporting them if there is one. Opportunities for bonding for those individuals also can have really important implications for parenting. Um, so your, your mom who's really exhausted who after um, labor and delivery and just doesn't feel like she can do some skin to skin with the newborn or just doesn't feel like she can feed it right then. Um, Offering that opportunity to the dad or to the partner who's there instead of the nurse taking over care um, can really enhance the bonding experience for that partner. So offering for the partner to do skin to skin instead of mom. That happens a lot with um, emergency C-sections where the moms are under general anesthesia and the baby is born, allowing the dad that opportunity to do skin to skin instead of mom um, can be a really positive thing instead of the nurse just taking the baby back to the nursery and not allowing the dad to have that opportunity. So again, um, we're really focused on family-centered care, not just the patient who is admitted on paper. <clears throat> so let's try to get through the physiology of labor. Um, what happens? Why does why does labor happen? Why does it occur? Um, onset of labor should begin somewhere between thirty eight and forty two weeks. Anything before that would be considered, or anything before thirty seven would be considered preterm, and then anything past forty two is considered post term. We don't know exactly what causes labor to, um, to begin, but we do know that there are some, poor, some very important things that happen that contribute to why labor starts. So there is a progesterone withdrawal. We know that progesterone maintains your pregnancy, and it maintains your pregnancy by... Um, keeping your smooth muscle relaxed. Progesterone is a smooth muscle relaxer, so it helps keep the uterus relaxed and not contracted, which helps to maintain the pregnancy. 
So if we have a progesterone withdrawal close to labor, then we take away the body's ability to keep that smooth muscle relaxed and contractions can begin to happen. There's also an estrogen surge, which, which stimulates those uterine contractions and connective tissues begin to loosen and soften up. Um, there's a thinning and an opening of the cervix, which is effacement and dilation in response to those contractions. And also, um, the hypothalamus and the uterine tissue will actually release oxytocin, and that also stimulates uterine contractions. So when we look at things from a, from a muscle standpoint on a cellular level, um, in true labor, contractions will actually shorten the muscle fibers in the uterus. And it, that puts a longitudinal traction on the cervix that helps to pull it up and thin it out. So your uterus almost becomes like a, um, more of a, really like an oval shape. It becomes longer. And uh, it does that because those, those muscles in the uterus start to shorten up and that pulls the cervix up. So it thins it out and it opens it up. Contractions are stimulated by oxytocin and I just told you that that comes from the hypothalamus and the uterine tissues will actually secrete that as well during labor. It, the uterus will elongate with each of those contractions which decreases um, the length of it or the horizontal diameter causes the fetus to straighten up a little bit in there. Um, the upper part of the uterus actually presses, um, presses against the fundus and the presenting part then is thrust, the presenting part of the fetus is thrust down towards the lower uterine segment or the cervix. So that helps to kind of open things up, that pressure. Um, Longitudinal muscle fibers then start to be pulled up over the presenting part, and that is how dilation happens. So there's the hydrostatic pressure of the fetal membranes that starts to help cause cervical dilation. I don't really care that you guys know um, every single step of this. Um, I just want you to understand that as the uterus contracts and elongates, um, it helps to efface and dilate the cervix. Um, and we measure that in centimeters, so we use a metric system. So what are some initial signs of labor? These are also called premonitory signs. Lightning is one of those, or um, engagement. So those two things are the same, the, the same term, lightning and engagement. And uh, the woman often refers to that as dropping. That's how she might describe it. My baby is dropped. Um, there's some good things that happen with lightning from a maternal standpoint. It's easier for her to breathe because that baby is dropped off and allowed. Now her diaphragm is able to actually expand a little better. Um, however, she might end up with leg cramps because of the pressure from the fetus down in that area. She may have pelvic pressure, so her gait changes a little. She might start to waddle or have to feel like she has to hold her legs apart more when she walks. Um, urinary frequency becomes a problem because that baby is lying on that bladder all the time. She might experience some edema in her lower extremities because of venous stasis. Um, vaginal secretions might start to increase because of all the pressure. And um, the, the baby settles into that pelvic inlet and um, causes her to be uncomfortable. Braxton Hicks contractions 
are uh, another, can, can be another initial sign of labor. Moms often describe this as a drawing sensation or they might say um, the baby feels like it's balling up in there. Um, these are irregular and they're intermittent and typically they're not very painful and Braxton Hicks contractions don't change the cervix. Um, Another premonitory sign are cervical changes. So the cervix starts to soften up or ripen is what the labor nurse will say. Um, and because of that, you might start to see bloody show. And that's a bloody mucus-like vaginal discharge and that happens with ripening. Um, usually when a mom sees bloody show, you can, you can bet that labor is gonna start within 24 to 48 hours. But um, bloody show can also be a result of vaginal exams as well. So if the mom has been to the doctor and um, the doctor has checked her cervix, she can see some bloody show from that too. Rupture of membranes. That is also a premonitory sign of labor. And we can have a bunch of different types of rupture of membranes. We can have PROM or P-R-O-M which is before the onset of labor. That means premature rupture of membranes. We can have SROM, which is spontaneous rupture of membranes, and that occurs usually at the height of an intense contraction. So the mom will have a very intense contraction and her bag of waters will just break. That's spontaneous or SROM. We can have AROM, which is artificial rupture of membranes, and that's done by a physician with, a, with something called an amnio hook. He, you actually have to have a dilated cervix, and he uses this little plastic hook-like thing when he does a vaginal exam and snags the bag of water and just pun punches a hole in it, basically. Um, that's artificial rupture of membranes. And then we can... Um, also have a premature um, rupture of membranes as well and that happens before 37 weeks. Um, so the important thing from a nursing standpoint whenever you notice rupture of membranes with if you assess rupture of membranes or you are, are taking a history regarding rupture of membranes, um, you want to know how much was there, what did it smell like, what did it look like, um, how much was there. So all of your COCA assessment things, you want to know what time it happens. Um, so you want to document the time. And if it's something that you are assessing or that you have witnessed, what does the baby's heart rate look like? So we want to document the time, COCA, and we want to assess the fetal heart rate and document that during rupture of membranes. We talked a lot about nesting and we know that's also an initial sign of labor. Moms also might have a possible um, weight loss and that happens because of a fluid shift regarding hormones. And then moms also can have some gastrointestinal upset. Many women will end up getting diarrhea right before they go into labor or while they're in sort of those first stages of labor, or they may have some nausea and vomiting. So what's our difference between true and false labor? Well, true labor happens when contractions are regular. Typically, the mom experiences pain in her lower back and her abdomen. There's a progressive pattern in true labor, meaning there is an increase in the frequency, the duration, and the intensity of those contractions. Mom cannot get any relief. She can't get any relief from, from um hydrating, she can't get any relief from getting up and walking, she can't get any relief from position change, she's just not able to get relief because she is in true labor. And true labor will also dilate the cervix and efface the cervix. <clears throat> Typically the pain in true labor um, can ha happens in the back and it'll radiate around to the abdomen 
Um, and again, you can't get it to go away by asking her to get up and walk. In false labor, labor, however, these people can actually get some relief with walking or position changes or hydrating them or getting them in a warm bath um, or a shower. In false labor, contractions are irregular. Usually they'll complain of pain in their abdomen and their groin area. The contraction pattern is not progressive, so it's very irregular. You cannot um, get a good idea of the frequency, the duration, or the intensity of the contractions. Um, again, relief is possible. And also, there's no cervical change in false labor. Um, in prima gravitas, dilation and effacement um, usually happen separately. So uh, in prima gravitas, what you typically see is effacement will happen first, and then the mom will start to dilate. But in multigravitas, those two things, dilation and effacement, typically happen at the same time. So you'll see them dilate and efface kind of together. All right, stages of labor. Let's, uh, I'm going to think I'm going to cut the video short here and do a second one so that it doesn't take quite as long to upload. So this is your, uh, the end of lecture one on individual module 5.2, PowerPoint one. And I will upload a second one starting with the stages of labor. Um, and that way it won't take so long to upload for you guys. Okay, uh, see you back in a bit. Thanks for listening.